2 Corinthians chapter 13. I appreciate you watching every Sunday, and I hope it's a blessing to you. If you're already saved, then our aim is to get you established in the faith. If you're not saved, we want you to see that you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it's our prayer that you'll be convicted for your need to be saved and that you'll understand that the only means of salvation is in Jesus Christ and that which he did for you at Calvary, and that is he died for you there. Today, we're going to continue with our thought pertaining to what must I do to be saved. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and notice in verse 5, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? Examine yourselves. How can you examine yourself? You cannot examine yourself based upon the doctrine of the church because the doctrine of the church changes over the years. Uh, you can't examine yourselves based upon the uh, traditions of men because traditions of men change. How can you examine yourself? You can't examine yourself based upon the philosophy of men. You say, well, I'll follow science. But science changes also. I have heard that you could go to a place in France and there would be shelves after shelves after shelves of science books that have been outdated. How are you going to examine yourself? The Bible said for you to examine yourself. You that are listening to me this morning that believe the Bible, you believe it's the Word of God, God said examine yourself whether you be in the faith. So how can you examine yourself? Well, there's only one way. You examine yourself by God's holy word. God's holy word does not change. And people say, well, it does too. There are new translations that come all the time. <laughs> well, that's true. But we're not talking about the translations of the Bible. We're talking about the Bible. I've got the Bible in my hand here. The Bible is a 1611 King James Bible. This Bible does not contradict itself. This Bible does not deny the virgin birth of Christ. It does not deny the blood atonement. It does not shed doubt on whether Christ is the virgin born son of God or no. Basically, the other Bibles in Luke 2.33 call Joseph the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is an, uh, a kind of a, a thing put in there for those who don't know any better to cause them to doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. Many of them deny the work of God Almighty in the creation of heaven and earth. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, they might say something to the effect, in the beginning when God began to create the heavens and the earth, which the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Bingo. It's done. God said it. Christ did it, the work was done, it's created. So I've got the Bible here. Over the years, there have been a lot of people that have tried to prove to me that this Bible is wrong. They've tried to prove to me that there are errors in it, you know, and that uh, it is archaic and outdated and on and on and on. And yet none of them have ever done this. I've never found anybody that has written anything that anyone has written pertaining to the King James Bible, trying to prove it is wrong. I've never found anything yet that caused me to doubt that. This book is the Word of God. And he said in this book, examine yourselves. Take the Word of God and examine yourself. How can you do this with the Word of God? The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, then we must divide the word of truth. All of the Bible is written for us. It is written for our admonition and learning, but obviously not all of the Bible is written directly to us in this age. So we must rightly divide the word of truth. So you examine yourself. Now, in Acts chapter uh, 16, verse 31, in the passage we've been dealing with, Paul and Silas have been thrown into a jail. They pray and sing songs unto God, and at midnight, 
an earthquake came. And this earthquake shook the walls in this old jail to the extent that Paul and Silas' bands were loosed. They were set free. And the prisoners were set free, and the jailer, realizing what had happened, is ready to kill himself. And Paul called out to him and said, Do thyself no harm. We're still here. And the Bible said, The man called for a light and ran into where they were and fell down on his knees in front of them. And he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And as I said before, they didn't answer the question. They didn't tell him what to do to be saved. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now I want to ask you, what would you do to be saved? I mean, really now, come on, think. If you're going to do something to be saved, what are you going to do? What is your plan? How do you plan to get out of the grave? The Bible said it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. You're going to die some of these days. You understand that? I mean, some sooner than others, but if the rapture doesn't come, if the church doesn't uh, be raptured out, if the Lord doesn't call us out, we that are saved by grace through faith, if we're not called out, we're going to die. You're going to die. That's just an absolute positive thing. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. You know anybody that hadn't died? <laughs> Come on, bring the individual forward. I want to see that individual that didn't die. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this is judgment, you're going to die. Then what's your plan? How are you going to get out of the grave? You got any idea about that? I mean, how are you going to solve that? Some people say, well, uh, it don't make no difference to me about the grave because when you're dead, you're just dead like a dog, and uh, your soul goes somewhere else, but most of those people that say they believe that, you start talking about them, about the body, soul, and spirit, and they'll deny the existence of it. What are you going to do? How are you going to be saved? Have you got any plans at all for your own salvation? How do you plan to get out of the grave? Number two, there are many of you that listen to my voice. I mean, you're reasonable. You believe the Bible, and you plan to go to heaven somehow. How are you going to do that? You got any plans? You're going to catch a, a, a spacecraft? How are you going to get out of this world? What are you going to do to be saved? What are your plans? Well, there's a lot of things in this Bible that people pick up. Do you realize, turn, in, turn your Bible please to Hebrews, and look in Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, notice in verse 22, Hebrews 9, 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. For, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Do you realize that the only way you can be forgiven by Almighty God is the shedding of blood? There can be no forgiveness for your sins. God cannot forgive you unless blood is shed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. So may I ask you, what are you going to offer? What is your sacrifice? Are you going to kill an animal? What are you going to do? Cut a chicken's head off? Shed the blood? Offer some kosher chicken? Why, most of you that buy meat, the blood's already been shed anyway. When did you ever shed any blood? And when I was a boy back on the farm, my daddy used to kill hogs. He used to shoot that hog and he'd lay down there. And while that hog is still quivering, the individual that knew what he was doing knew exactly where to stick a knife in that hog, and they would stick a knife in his throat, a long bladed knife, and the blood would just gush out. It would just pour out on the ground. They always covered the blood. But they didn't do that for remission of sins. What will you offer for remission of your sin? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Will you kill a cat? I understand that the uh, police officers are finding them around where the cults today are sacrificing animals. They're sacrificing cats and animals and whatever. What are you going to offer? Notice in Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, notice in verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. In other words, you could offer 
animal sacrifices, but they wouldn't take away your sins. They wouldn't make you perfect, the Bible says. The Bible is clear in that context there that there was one that offered a sacrifice. He was perfect, and his sacrifice pleased Almighty God and is to never be repeated. But then let's not stop there. Look in Hebrews chapter 10, look in verse 18. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. That is, where there's remission for your sins, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. For instance, if I were to mark on the board up here, and I say that right back here is the beginning of the sacrificial offerings. In fact, the first one that I know anything about is in the Garden of Eden, and God Almighty took animals, killed them, and stripped their hides off, and covered Adam and Eve, covered their nakedness with the hides of these animals. So God believes in shedding of blood. But wait a minute. He said, where a mission of your sins are, there is no more need for a sacrifice. But I find that when Moses gave the law, he dedicated it with blood and animal sacrifices were offered. All the way through in the law, there are blood sacrifices one after the other. In fact, God Almighty tells you in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7, and he says, if you are to bring a sacrifice, if you're going to bring a sacrifice to God, he tells what kind of sacrifice it would be back there. And my point is, they continuously offered blood sacrifices year after year after year. Bloody, smelly mess, blood running out, stripping the animals of their hides, cutting their insides out, and on and on and on. What are you going to do? What kind of sacrifice you got in mind? Where remission of your sins is, there's no more offering for sin. In other words, why then would they continue to offer those sacrifices if the blood of animals could do the job? The point is the blood of animals can't do the job. But what will do the job? Well, there is one that came into this world, and when John the Baptist pointed him out, John the Baptist pointed out the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ is God's lamb sacrifice. Jesus Christ is God's book sacrifice. He's the heifer. He's the whole thing. He filled all sacrifices, and they need never be done again. In Hebrews chapter 10, notice in verse 5. Hebrews 10, verse 5, the Bible said, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared me, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. In other words, God wouldn't take any pleasure in you offering a blood sacrifice. That wouldn't please God at all. In fact, it'd probably anger him. Uh, in verse uh, 7, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written, of me, to do thy will, O God, above when he saith, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadest pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that's the first covenant, that he may establish the second, that's the new covenant, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. In other words, Jesus Christ then went to Calvary and Jesus Christ offered himself to God. The Bible said that God delivered him up for us all. God denied him. God turned his back on him. Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did God forsake his son at Calvary? Because your sin was placed upon him. And the Bible said that he was made to be sin for us. Him who knew no sin became our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ took your place at Calvary. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. Isn't it amazing? All the way in the Old Testament scriptures back there, men offered sacrifices to God. But in A.D. 33, God Almighty offered a sacrifice to you. Back there, men offered gifts. They offered gifts unto God. In A.D. 33, God offered a gift unto you. God doesn't want your gifts. God doesn't want your money. Why, the Bible said he owns the cattle on a thousand hill, the gold and the silver is his. What are you going to offer to God? What will you offer him that will please him? God doesn't want your gifts. He wants you to receive his gift. 
His gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why, well, he said, no man cometh to the Father but by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth and the life. He's the only means of salvation for you. God Almighty gave you a gift at Calvary. He offered the one gift that fulfills all gifts. He offered the one sacrifice that never needs to be repeated again. But people don't believe that, do they? Why, in fact, there are people that offer sacrifices every so-called Sabbath under the Lord, thinking that they're pleasing God. Look at the next verse. In verse 11, And every priest standeth daily, ministering often, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Your mass can't take away your sins, and your mass is not a memorial of sins being taken away. Every time those wafers are offered there, they're supposedly transformed into the body of Christ. And the wine is supposedly transformed into the blood of Christ. And the people eat the body of Christ, supposedly, and the priest drinks the blood of Christ, supposedly. Turn in your Bible, please, to Psalm. I look in Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Look what the Bible says about this. In Psalm 16, notice in verse 4. Psalm 16, verse 4. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer nor take up their names into my lips. You know anybody that has regularly been offering blood sacrifices? Come on now. If a priest is able to turn wine into blood, then he's drinking a blood sacrifice and you know it. If he's able to turn a wafer into the flesh of Jesus Christ, he is sacrificing the flesh of Jesus Christ and people are eating it regularly. That's the whole idea. And yet my Bible said that he offered one sacrifice forever, never to be repeated again. It is never to be done again. And if what is being done is a memorial of that which already has been done, then why use the transubstantiation thing in there and change it into something that is not? What kind of sacrifice will you offer to God? God doesn't want your sacrifices. God wants your faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice. But let's not stop there. How about what will you do to be saved? Will you keep the law? Is that your plan? Do you plan that you're going to keep the commandments, you're going to do the Ten Commandments? Well, turn in your Bible, please, to Romans and look in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Well, that rules that out. You're not going to be able to keep the law and get saved. There is no righteousness to be had by you by keeping of the law. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So you can't keep the law and get saved. Say, well then, if I can't keep it and get saved, why'd God give it? Good question. God gave it to show you you're a sinner. God gave it to show you that you're unable to do it. Look in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, verse 3, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. You can't be saved by keeping the law. So what are you going to do? 
You know, I like for you to think about Paul. It fascinates me when I think about this. Look in Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, verse 1, Paul said, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Do you see what that said? Paul said that I am so concerned for these Israelites I'm a Hebrew, I'm an Israelite, and I'm co so concerned for them that I could wish myself accursed from Christ for them. In other words, Paul is saying if it would do anything for them, if it would save them, if it would help, I would go to hell. I would be condemned and doomed and damned to hell if it would get them saved. Of course it wouldn't. Now think. If the law could get you saved, if keeping the commandments could get you saved, if keeping the commandments could help you out, would God have allowed Paul to say such a thing and it be written in the Word of God? If the law could save people, why would Paul say, I could wish myself a curse from Christ for my kinsmen, my brethren, according to the flesh? In fact, they were given the law. Back there, Moses was given the law for Israel. And God said in Exodus chapter 19, Go speak unto these people. Tell Israel, if you'll obey my commandments and keep my covenants, then you'll be, and on and on and on. The law was given to Israel. But it never saved them. It never kept them from being condemned. It never kept them from being doomed in their own efforts. And so Paul said, I'm so concerned for them that I could wish myself accursed from Christ for them. He didn't say I do, he said I could. But you know what? It wouldn't have helped. <clears throat> Why? Why Paul knew, Hebrews chapter 10, he knew there had been one sacrifice for sin forever and there was never to be another sacrifice offered to take away your sins. So, hey, Offering a blood sacrifice won't get you saved. Keeping the commandments won't get you saved. What are you going to do then? Say, well, I'll get baptized. <laughs> well, how's that going to do? Turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, who was given the gospel of the Gentiles, look what he said. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, he said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel on and on. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He said, for Christ sent me not to baptize. It is obvious to the Bible believer that Christ sent the twelve to baptize. Why, in Matthew 28, he said, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus said unto them, Go and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, on and on and on. In Acts chapter 2, they said, What must we do? Peter said, Repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. But Paul said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, then obviously baptism is not associated with the gospel that the, Paul, the apostle Paul preached. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Baptism is set in contrast to the gospel. Baptismal salvation is in contrast with the good news that Christ died for your sins in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. There is no water baptism in Paul's writings. There is not one admonition to you that you ought to be baptized for remission of sins. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is given the gospel of the Gentiles and said, Christ sent me not to baptize. Now think about it. He said, I could wish myself accursed from Christ for my kinsmen. Paul, why don't you go baptize them? He was going into the synagogues. 
He was preaching in the synagogues. Why not get them all baptized? Why say, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, if baptism would save people that he said I could go to hell if I could get them saved? Anybody that tells you that you ought to be baptized to get remission of sins is talking through his hat. He's blowing smoke. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's got a pipe dream and only God knows what he's been smoking in the pipe. You can be baptized until your skin wrinkles and still die and go to hell. What are you going to do to save your never dying soul? That jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Uh, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Are you in the faith? Well, you're not in the faith by offering blood sacrifices. You're not in the faith by keeping the commandments. You're not in the faith by getting baptized. What are you going to do? Be a good neighbor? <laughs> People say, well, I just treat my neighbor right. I won't walk on their grass and I won't kick their cat and I won't spit on the sidewalk. I'll just be good. Turn to Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, notice in verse 10, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Verse 12, They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to people that are trying to keep the law. There's none that doeth good. You can't do good by keeping the law. You can't do good by offering blood sacrifices. You're not doing good by getting baptized. You're not doing good where salvation is concerned by trying to be good to your neighbor. It is right to be good to your neighbor. You ought to be a good neighbor. But being a good neighbor won't get you out of this world and get you into heaven. Being a good neighbor won't get you out of the grave and get you off up on the other side in resurrection. The Bible said, Jesus Christ told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can't get into God's kingdom without a new birth. And water won't get it for you. You know how that's going to be? You're going to have to die, go into a tomb, and rise from the dead to be born again, as Jesus did. Will you believe in Christ? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He offered the sacrifice for your sins. He paid for your sins at Calvary. You can be saved right now if you'll trust him. Will you do it right now? Trust him as your Lord and Savior today. Thank you for listening. Until next time, good day.